all had fun and met a lot of new friends last night or maybe saw some old faces. Uh, today, I'm excited. We have two great panels. The first one is about to happen, Human Computer Interaction Today. It's moderated by Sarah Fox, our new presidential postdoc fellow. I'm so excited. Uh, new faculty member, Patrick Carrington. Derek Lomas, alumni and my former student, along with Ken Katinger. Amy Ogan and Linning Yao, also current faculty. So I'm going to give it over to them. Thank you, Jody, and thank you all for being here bright and early. Um, so I am very excited to uh, be moderating the panel today on uh, human-computer interaction today. And the idea is um, to kind of collect the opinions of this esteemed panel of uh, faculty members to reflect on where we are as a field at present. Um, so as Jody mentioned, we have a panel uh, made up of uh, Patrick Carrington, Amy Ogan, uh, Linning Yao, and Derek Lomas, um, who have all um, connections to CMU HCII, either as faculty members or as alum, or both. So the structure for the panel today um, is about kind of setting up a bit of a debate. We wanted to have a little bit of fun to start off the day. Um, so in the first round of uh, brief presentations, we'll talk about how HCI, uh, first and foremost, is about advancing technology. Um, and then, uh, and that will uh, encompass the work of Patrick and Linning. Um, and then kind of pitted against them is Amy and Derek, yeah. who, will make a, who will make a case for the need to address human needs um, and values. So this is meant to be kind of in the spirit of fun, but it also reflects uh, a set of kind of bifurcations that sometimes we feel exist within the field. So when we were talking about um, setting up and organizing this panel, we felt sometimes that conferences um, were a bit separated by subtracts and things like this, and there isn't always that cross-pollination that we uh, might want. So to start us off, um, we have Patrick. We need a clicker. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so as Sarah said, I'm going to kick it off with uh, kind of an overview about uh, kind of how advancing technology um, leads us to being able to support ability and performance through technology. Uh, so just to give you kind of an overview of how I kind of view HCI and some of the important issues that kind of draw me to and through the field, um, ability is kind of at the center of that. And you can think of this both from a human perspective as well as from a computing side of things. Um, but ability, thinking about the capacity to do something. So having the capacity to do something in the broad sense, uh, pretty much anything, a talent, skill, or proficiency. Um, and so I take three different perspectives on this in my work. Um, the first one being disability. So my focus is on accessibility um, through my research. So this tends to involve assistive technology as well as ability-based design. Um, the second one being human performance, so with the way that we can think about um, people uh, performing at a high level, so you have elite, high, high performance uh, individuals as well as computing from a performance perspective. Um, this can support creativity, can support competition, um, and achievement. And so you can think about technology influencing uh, development in all of these different areas and being able to advance just the uh, broad capabilities that we have as a society. Um, and then the third one is quality of life, which I think all of us can appreciate, um, involving enjoyment, experience, and expectations, which kind of ties into the first two uh, for my work, where you have expectations of what's possible, expectations of what different people are able to achieve, and expectations of abilities that we have. And so in, to give you kind of four points to think about, humans and ability, access and ability, sports and ability, and technology and ability. And so these are kind of themes of my work. Um, and so this involves a number of different kinds of technologies and different groups of people. Um, so the first I want to just kind of highlight through a few projects that kind of bring this to the forefront. Um, the first one being wheelchair natural user interfaces. So a lot of times we think about wheelchairs, we think about the mobility, um, we think about medical devices, we think about getting from point A to point B. What we don't typically think about is the expressive potential uh, that the wheelchair offers as a technology platform. And so you have this large device huge batteries, um, 
places to hide wires, wait, ways to leverage technology in new ways to attach sensing and actually leverage this high availability of compute power that has become um, kind of ubiquitous in society. Um, and so the kind of one of the biggest areas here, so we think of wheelchair-based technologies, um, a lot of times we have these very simple interactions using a switch or maybe even a scanning interface where you go from one item to the next. But then we kind of counterpose that to um, in innovative interaction techniques that are advancing all the time. And so there, there are things that we should be able to leverage in that space. Um, basically, we should be able to do better. And so this is one way that advancing technology can ad help us advance human performance. So if we are able to attach all of these different things, we can move forward pretty quickly. Um, one area that we can think about that in kind of more of a futuristic sense, in especially in terms of accessibility, is AR and VR applications. So for um, applying these uh, advanced technologies in this space, um, <clears throat> we can make uh, new interactions possible. Currently, a lot of interactions in AR and VR are very visual, although we are using our whole bodies. And so one uh, area that I'm working on to try to advance this is being able to translate content, leveraging all these different modalities that we have access to in uh, VR space and AR space. Uh, further than that, uh, we also have sensing that we can add to different experiences to create uh, opportunities for balanced and equitable competition and changing the landscape of what it means to compete. Uh, so for wheelchair sports, I have a project called SpokeSense where we're attaching sensors to wheelchairs in order to give feedback to different athletes as well as their teams and players, uh, teams and administrators of the sport uh, to facilitate uh, new conversations, as well as to facilitate kind of strategy development and new approaches to uh, new approaches to doing things, which is you know embodied by this sensing, embodied by analytics. Um, kind of more generally speaking, we've all thought about how HCI and computing have advanced sports. So anybody who watches sports has noticed that instant replay has kind of advanced a lot in the past few years. Um, and it really changes the experience. We're able to be very connected with the things that we watch and things that we engage with um, in, in many new ways. I'll hand it off. Um, so my name is Lining, and uh, I um, run a research group called Morphing Matter Lab. I joined, this is my first uh, uh, experiences to join the HCI alumni parties. Uh, so it's super exciting because I came two years ago, missed the last one. So I actually first time put this title as my public talk. It's called Human Material Interaction. I think it, it make a lot of... Um, it has a strong meaning to me because I'm mentioning this term in a panel talk about the present of HCI research in one of the leading um, uh, HCI institution. So I think we live in a material age and we have been living in material age in the past and we will in the future. Look at the uh, history of the culture and technology. We have always been growing uh, with the advancement of materials. If you look at this chart, we are now kind of in this um, computational material age. And back, or maybe also a little bit of present, we were all about um, silicon, silicon and information age. That is also material related. That is the synthetic material and silicon based synth synthetic material. And uh, uh, in our lab, the vision is that we will push further where the material will go and how, as human-computer interaction researcher, uh, to, uh, to grow together with the growth of the material invention. So material is pretty much computable nowadays and is computable across different, different scales, uh, all the way down to uh, molecules and even atoms, to all the way up to uh, macrostructures that is pretty much human scale or environmental and architectural scale. Um, and uh, if we all believe in human-computer interaction, I think what we are really believing in is human-computation interaction. And then if you are with me, uh, computation is now happening in materials. I think it is a great moment to talk about human-material interaction. 
Uh, that's what our group does. So we try to find this uh, niche intersection between the advanced morphing matter development and also the uh, user-centered design aspects of it. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, techniques we leverage, mostly from the um, uh, mechanics, material engineering, as well as the uh, computational uh, design and also the advanced manufacturing aspect. So we develop materials, we develop software and hardware computational tools. We also widely think about how, how those techniques can be applied for daily design use cases. So the, there are some interpretations of what morphing matter are. Uh, morphing matter can transform. So in this case, it's a sweat responsive garment. Uh, when the dancers got sweatier and the body get hot, so these um, materials will automatically uh, open up and help you to get rid of the excessive heat. And then it will close down once your body cools down. It is a living bacteria powered interfaces on body. And this is a uh, self-assembly material. I call it morphing matter can self-assemble. So here you print a material that has memory in it and um, um, you print it flat. Uh, and you save almost um, uh, one, uh, actually um, five sixths of the printing time. And then it, it will self fold back into a rose once you dip this flat sheet into water. And morphing matter can also self assemble in a way to create functional electronics. Here is a robot that you can print flat, but it will self assemble into a 3D shape and responds to light. And morphing matter can self heal like your skin. Uh, in this case, it's a controller you can cut into uh, into four if two uh, uh, friends are joining you for a game, and you can always bring them back together. It will self heal into one. So it's just, uh, yeah, this is a heart that you know it was broken, but then you bring it back together. You see, after six hours, it grow into one. So <laughs> it got yeah. It, it. And morphing matter can also sense. So we are talking about the autonomous future of self-aware uh, sensing materials. So this morphing matter attached to your neck can sense what food you are eating and uh, tell you, hey, apple is healthier than potato chips. Um, morphing matter can also respond. So this is artificial mimosa made of morphing paper. So when you touch it, it will respond um, and also automatically close down, like how our artificial, uh, sorry, natural plants are. Morphing matter can also self-adapt. It's a narrow uh, brick, you, uh, sorry, a stick that you poke into a narrow spaces and you can grab trash out of it. And also you can um, let a little heart transform and get locked in a wish bottle. So morphing matter goes softer. So we, uh, we think about morphing matter with all kinds of materials, even including conventional fabric. So this is a 3D knitted uh, uh, robotic, robotic materials. Um, and you can uh, create all kinds of soft goods with it. Yeah, my uh, student, uh, Leah, so she's wearing a um, morphing robotic sweater. So morphing matter of today can sense and morph and adapt. And morphing matter of tomorrow can uh, be autonomous, be robotic, can be computational, can become true interface that has input and output. And uh, we are pushing the vision um, of uh, Mark Wizards. So we wanted information and computation weaved into our daily life seamlessly. And we do that by make computer disappear. That's it. <laughs> So from Lenning and Patrick, we heard about pushing forward kind of soft and hard and all the in-between materials to enhance kind of human capability and to reimagine what computational systems could look like. Um, and holding up the uh, other side of this <laughs> dichotomy um, is Derek and Amy. Um, so I'll pass it on to them. Amy first. All right, great. So. We had a conversation before we uh, you know, came to the ideas for this panel, and, and one of our charges was to be a little controversial. So I'm going to ask whether we actually need a neck brace to tell us that an apple is uh, healthier than a, a bag of potato chips. <laughs> So the, the way that, that we sort of uh, conceptualize our work in, in my lab is thinking about um, the ways in which educational technologies can scale. And that doesn't mean just in terms of 
getting millions or billions of users on one system, but how do we actually create technologies that work in a context and really deliver on the promise of education enhanced through technology for a particular set of learners? And so, uh, in my lab, we've done this by doing deep field work in 11 different countries where we engage with learners across socioeconomic boundaries, um, across ethnicities, across genders, and, and thinking through all of the issues that might arise uh, based on that context and, and the needs of the particular learners in order to understand how to create educational technologies that, um, that lift the learner in their current context. Um, so I'm just going to dive into uh, one particular uh, project more deeply, which is thinking about uh, learners in the west coast of Africa, uh, and specifically in the regions in the Cote d'Ivoire, in which there's a lot of child labor happening in the cocoa fields, uh, meaning that children are missing a lot of school. Um, they have difficulty both in attending, but then in class when they get there. And this leads to some significant educational challenges. In fact, uh, our research has shown across sites in the country that most fifth graders are not currently reading even a single age-appropriate work. So this is a real struggle for the children, for their parents, for the teachers, for everyone, all of the stakeholders involved in that context. And, and the question is, how do we go about uh, addressing these sorts of challenges? Uh, well, one aspect that we found is, is related to technology. And in fact, in this uh, context, there's 130% uh, mobile phone adoption. That means there's more than one phone per person. So already you're thinking this is a technology-rich environment. Fantastic. However, it turns out that the vast majority of these are feature phones, basic phones with no internet, no, no data access, so just calling and SMS features. Um, and so as we dove into the context, working closely with our collaborators in the Ivory Coast, uh, what we are finding is that while you might expect in a country where there's 130% mobile adoption that the children are growing up as digital natives, uh, it turns out that um, the particular cultural circumstances change the way that that technology is distributed. And so uh, the children may actually never hold or, or be able to take advantage of that technology in the family setting. And so where in other work we've found that children can be digital brokers for their parents, the, the kids are actually the ones that are, you know, showing their parents how to use an app, how to, uh, you know, post a video on TikTok. <laughs> the, uh, in this case, um, the parents are actually acting as digital brokers for the children. Uh, and this is true even in cases where they don't have the actual literacy uh, involved in order to be able to teach them or support their learning how to read. So, um, so digital literacy is one uh, resource we have from the parents that they can use to support their children. And so from this, we've developed a system called Allo Alphabet that teaches French literacy. Uh, you can see our, our user there with a, the basic phone in his hand, uh, but where children, siblings, uh, parents, other relatives are around in the context and, and are providing support on this technology um, in ways that they are able to bring value to the circumstances. So, so this is one project where we're thinking about um, the idea of invisible technology. So using what's already in the family's hands, these basic phones, and creating the advancement on the server side rather than the client side so that we can actually use AI and other advanced technologies, but they're not impeding the progress of the learner themselves. Uh, on the other hand, teachers actually do, in this context, have smartphones. And so we're able to apply the same principles, but think about the technologies that they're currently using. In this case, it's WhatsApp. Uh, they're regularly using this to communicate to one another, to engage with uh, for social reasons, but also for economic reasons. And so on the other end, uh, on the server side, we can actually build bots using AI, using natural language processing that facilitate 
the ways that the teachers are working and learning in professional development settings, but, but being invisible to them. So it's all working through a technology that they're already engaged with. Um, uh, in East Africa, in Tanzania, uh, we are working with a slightly more advanced technology. So now we've got tablets in the setting. But what we're looking at here is the ways in which these tablets disrupt or, or enhance current pedagogical practices in the classroom. So this is a setting in which teaching is transmission oriented. Uh, there's a famous paper that says, uh, in Africa, teachers speak and children listen. Uh, when you bring a, a, a tablet into that setting, it completely changes the dynamic. So the research we're doing here is to understand uh, in what ways can these systems actually be integrated? How can peers support one another in this setting? But how can we seamlessly integrate this into the teacher's pedagogical practices so that they don't disrupt, it doesn't disrupt the classroom? Uh, many of you may have been in this context. I've been in a lot of classrooms around the world where uh, technology has been introduced and it's locked in a closet. Uh, the technology never comes out because it doesn't currently fit in to the school system, the administration, and, and the teachers' ways of being and doing. And this is what my lab is trying to understand as we're developing new supports and new technologies. Um, and even, of course, when we bring the tablets into the classroom, we have to be aware of all of the other issues that that introduces. Here's the solar panel setup that we bring to power the tablets when the electricity goes out. So uh, uh, yes, always being aware of what's available in the context and also what, um, what we need to bring to make this happen. So I think overall, I'll, I'll end by saying that um, uh, what this work has brought to the table is, uh, for one, a, a sense of moving. I think um, this, this panel was introduced as human needs versus advancing technology. But we're not just looking at human needs. We're looking at human aspirations and where people would like to be, how they envision themselves in the future, and making sure that we use technologies that aren't a barrier but actually a facilitator for understanding human aspirations. Secondly, um, a realization that uh, not only is the, the user not like me, sometimes they're radically not like me, and we need to sometimes go back and rethink all of our assumptions about the context. Um, and uh, that also brings up the idea that, that we need good collaborators with deep expertise, and so um, that's something that I think HCI today is really engaged with. It's not a solo sport. <laughs> We are working together, we're working with experts across domains interdisciplinarily uh, and making sure that um, we draw all of that expertise together to create solutions that actually bring about the social good that we're all hoping for. All right, so I will... Uh, over to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek. Uh, I graduated in 2014 with Jody and Ken. I spent uh, two years out in San Diego uh, at the design lab with Don Norman, and now I'm uh, at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, so come visit me in Amsterdam. Um, I'm really loving it there. Um, I, I wanted to share a couple stories today on the ideas of, of human needs in our technology systems. I've been thinking a lot about uh, how to embed uh, humanistic values into technology systems. Um, I'm based at the, the Delft Institute for Positive Design, which uses principles of positive psychology to help support uh, human well-being. And of course, that's what we want in our runaway AI systems to be uh, uh, you know, cultivated by them in the future. Um, well, actually, we don't know exactly what we want our AI systems to be optimizing for. Um, so there's a few provocations in this talk. Um, so I, back before um, I realized that uh, uh, qualitative research was much more difficult than uh, quantitative research, um, I, I was uh, working in India uh, on some ethnographic design research looking at the adoption of mobile phones. And I spent a lot of time in electronics markets. Um, and I kept coming across this $15 computer, which was really impressive because Nicholas Negroponte had his one laptop per child program in full swing at the time. 
And the concept was that if you could just make the technology cheap and accessible enough, then you would be able to educate the world. Um, I was skeptical because this computer came with a gun, uh, but it, uh, uh, it kept on showing up in all these different configurations, and so I finally got one. It used a television as a screen, um, and actually, if you bargain, it's only $10. Um, and it came with all this educational software that I thought was just so cool. Um, you know, used a little mouse to navigate, uh, you had typing games, you could make music. You could even program your own video games in a, a version of basic uh, design just for that. And this idea that a, an 8-bit computer was still relevant because it was fun and it provided software that people cared about um, was really inspiring for me. Uh, it came with one million video games. You can see I got to the end of the list there. Uh, and the gun was for Duck Hunt because this was uh, uh, this was not exactly a legal product, but it had been sold um, uh, and pirated so many times it had morphed into this approach. I grew up with a bunch of 8-bit video games. I thought they were great. Um, we made a bunch of new 8-bit video games for this platform. But what the platform was, for me, was um, uh, an illustration of the fact that technology is going to be very accessible. There's going to be a lot of technology around. And it's not that we just need to make it cheap enough. We need to make things that actually have the values in them that we want to convey. At CMU, I made a, a lot of different video games. One of the questions was, do they, they work? I switched to um, uh, a, a program where, uh, with the company that I created uh, and the research uh, that I was conducting, that, that we could reach a, a sort of scale um, where we could be conducting experiments about how the software was driving forward student outcomes. So the idea that we could use theory to make software, that we could take that to scale, that we could run experiments there that could both contribute to theory as well as um, just make the outcomes better. This was a sort of model that uh, I care a lot about. Um, but one of the, one of the imp imp uh, implementations of this, we thought, okay, well, we've made all these different variations of the games. We've, we've made um, uh, all these different design approaches to try to increase student engagement. You know, couldn't we design some sort of AI system that would automatically improve uh, the game to just you know drive student engagement forward. And so we did that. We, we used this multi arm Banda algorithm and we, we were able to successfully automatically enhance the, the student engagement, but then we started getting the phone calls from um, the, the company that we were hosting this game with. They were saying, oh, you know, we started getting complaints. There's, there's something wrong with your game. And it had, um, it had been mutilated uh, by this, this algorithmic approach where students were playing it longer, but that's because the whole educational game was now just about these giant explosions on the screen. And it, it sort of revealed that it's, it's going to be really possible to use these powerful algorithms to automatically optimize. We've got to make sure that we're, we're optimizing what we what we want, and, and that's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to take human values and turn them into metrics that we can optimize, but we need to do that, and we need to recognize the risks in doing that as well. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, I care about creating these smart systems that use data to drive improvement. I also really care about this humanistic value inquiry around what we should be improving. Um, the States has the second highest rate of childhood poverty, um, in you know the, the Western world, um, there's a lot of uh, negative effects of of poverty on on education. Um, that we see in our own consulting work the effects of student um, of school poverty on student performance on all these little formative quizzes that that students take, and uh, there's this opportunity to use data that's coming from the systems that were. Uh, deploying to incrementally improve situations. And I'm a big fan of, of incremental improvement, um, creating these feedback loops that teachers can use, that algorithms can use, that students can use to, uh, to understand what the value is that we're trying to, to address. The, what's the area of need? Um, how do we measure that? 
And then what can we do about it? And it's just this sort of simple loop that I think is, um, I think it's a better way of thinking about artificial intelligence. Um, the idea that when we frame things up in this way, we're not thinking about what algorithm do we use. We think about, okay, well, where can we get this data that's a signal of the value that we're trying to create? And, and what are the different um, opportunities for creating interventions in this broader system that, uh, that we can design for? And so, uh, of course, I love this backwards design methodology where you, you try to create this alignment between uh, your goals, your, your metrics, which is sort of the, the needle you're trying to move, and then creating a design that can move that needle. Um, Data-driven decision-making works in high-poverty schools. It's something that is one of the few things that, that does uh, consistently. I wanted to share just a couple of different projects that take this orientation. Um, in medicine, uh, Wellness, well-being matters, of course. I mean, you, you go to the doctor because you're not well. Um, you want to be cured, of course, but that's not always the right frame. And it's amazing how little data can come back into medical systems about patient wellness. So this project is about making uh, data collection for doctors, nurses, hospital systems as easy as possible so that people can um, have a regular check-in about different factors of their well-being, um, you know, whether that's pain uh, or exercise or nutrition or seeing friends. These different things have a major impact on your, your medical outcomes, but they're also the point of the medical treatment to begin with. Um, as part of this, we've, uh, we've developed a, a system called NeuroUX that's uh, for psychiatric researchers to measure different aspects of, of cognition using mobile phones. So rather than bringing people into a lab to run these cognitive tests, um, we're able to run these ecological momentary assessments where um, uh, people can uh, have, have measures of inhibition control or working memory or, um, or even mood and, and, and other uh, uh, aspects of uh, a person's um, condition. Being able to facilitate the data collection around mental health care um, can, again, in the future, create these, these data feedback loops that, that don't exist today um, at scale. Here's another sort of simple project where the idea was that there are certain behaviors in a wheelchair that are associated with wellness. Um, moving regularly, stretching, having correct posture, being able to identify those behaviors and then being able to develop machine learning models that can identify them and then building them into these feedback loops um, with apps so that people can be aware of their good behaviors over time. Um, and finally, this is a, uh, a program that we're working on now uh, where we're trying to team up AI and, and parents. So one of the challenges that I've had in making all these different video games is that my my wife isn't a big fan of the kids being on the iPad. And that can turn into a little bit of a challenge because, you know, I make these, these games and then, okay, uh, can we play now? Oh, well, they've already had their screen time for the day. Um, so the, the concept here was um, instead of having the, the model of interaction between a computer screen and a kid, um, can you have the mode of interaction be between the parent and the child, but still supported by AI algorithms that are keeping track of um, what the child has answered in, in the past. And so it's a fact fluency program um, where parents read out the question to the, the kid two minutes a day, um, and they mark whether uh, they were uh, fast and correct or slow um, or incorrect. And then what you're able to do there is uh, a parent is able to intervene in all kinds of little ways, motivationally, um, conceptually, to help their child in, in a way that uh, a computer obviously can't. So I, I wanted to um, close out with uh, just a, a little discussion about how some of our values can, can be benefited when we go deep, deeper into the sources of, of understanding. So I, I was always really inspired by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's theories of flow. Um, we want flow states. It's a nice experience to have. We, we, we want to have our work 
uh, feel good. Um, we want learning to feel good. We want to be in these flow states. Um, and the, the theory that I've been exposed to and that he advocates is this idea that flow occurs when things aren't too hard and they aren't too easy, but you're in a state of difficulty that's just right. And if you can be in this state of difficulty that's just right, uh, you're in this flow state. And so we wanted to test this theory. Um, we used this video game that uh, was a fraction video game. Um, it's very simple. You try to estimate where the ship is by typing in a, a fraction. Um, and there's, uh, this is a sort of modern version of it. Uh, and there's all these different ways of adjusting the difficulty. You can make the targets bigger, and then they're easier to hit, and that's, that's easier. You can change the time limits. Um, and so we, we created all of these different variations. We had a 2 by 9 by 8 by 6 by 4 by 4 factorial. And uh, you know, we put this online, and we had about 70,000 players. And so um, the goal was to understand the relationship between difficulty and how long students were playing. Um, and so we assumed that somewhere in the middle, we'd find this just right area uh, where students were playing the longest. And so that was the sort of theory. And what we actually found was that the easier it was, the longer students played always. The only place that this was different was when we were just repeating the items over and over again, and they'd, they'd get it right. It was very boring. Um, and so this, this notion, I, w I went back and his books because I remember reading his books and really enjoying them. And he talks about flow as um, the state of mind when consciousness is harmoniously ordered, which is a really different way of framing things. He says, when an important goal is pursued with resolution and all of one's varied activities fit together into a unified flow experience, the result is that harmony is brought to consciousness. That's, that's almost sounding like this, uh, well, it's sort of like a new age uh, um, uh, approach. But there's something about this that, that I really appreciate because the whole mindedness that we experience in the types of flow states that we desire, I mean, he's not thinking about anything else right now. Um, you know, when we do these hard things, we're completely consumed uh, by the experience. But we also experience this doing things that aren't hard at all. Um, you know, we can find ourselves in a flow state when we're just talking with friends because we're not thinking about anything else. We're whole-mindedly engaged with, with our task. Play, for instance. I mean, this is another place where, where flow happens. And so this idea that what we're trying to go for is creating experiences that allow people to feel a, a sense of inner harmony, um, I think we should take these sorts of ideas more seriously in our uh, pursuit of, of design. And I've been thinking a lot about resonance in design theory, because if you think about it, what designers do is they try to figure out what resonates with people. And I came across this quote from Jody that I really liked. Um, so as people go beyond traditional aspects of usability, the need to create emotional resonance between people and products increases. And I really appreciate this, this view because there's, there's a sort of, um, this, we took this very seriously. This is a Dutch design week now. Uh, it's this giant vibrating web, and you can set the different frequency of vibration uh, as you like. And so we're, we're trying to understand why is it that people like certain uh, frequencies versus others? Um, you know, why does that resonate with them? I like taking these things as seriously as I possibly can, because um, it's all vibrations, man. Uh, so th the point here is that we, we want to balance out our scientific, rationalist, reductionist approaches to design, which are extremely powerful. We want to set goals, and we want to have metrics, and we want to create optimization systems. But we don't want to lose out on the magic of design, which is very real, the kind of intuitive and holistic and value-oriented uh, approaches that we feel um, when we're designing for other people. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Derek and Amy. That was a fabulous um, kind of 
representation of, of work across aims of um, promoting aspirations that people might have, well-being, harmony, joy, kind of all the um, stuff that's hard to kind of capture and kind of represent uh, quantitatively across the system. So kind of a counterbalance to what we heard initially um, in terms of advancing uh, technological um, needs. But actually, we wanted to switch it up a little bit because <laughs> These things are not mutually exclusive, as Derek kind of indicated um, there. There's a need to um, kind of join together and kind of integrate into practice both advancing technology and addressing human needs when doing um, work in human-computer interaction. So part of the exercise that we wanted to do today was to kind of represent, re-represent the work of each of the panelists from the kind of inverse of um, what they kind of threw down in the initial set of discussions. Um, so Amy will start us off. Great. So uh, as you'll see in this video here of one of our il other illustrious faculty members teaching, <laughs> um, is uh, um, some of the ways that we are actually using advanced technologies to understand how to actually achieve a human need or a human aspiration about um, the desire to be a very successful teacher. And so uh, one of the things that teachers often get very little of is feedback on their teaching. And so we thought of a lot of low-tech ways to do this, but actually also a, a lot of ways in which technology can add something to the mix that isn't possible in any other way, which is to digitally represent all of the participants in a teaching situation in ways that uh, lead us towards the, the collection of data that can be re-represented to an instructor uh, in order for them to engage in reflection and planning on that experience. So this in particular is, I think, relates to what Derek's been saying as well about thinking through what outcomes we'd like to see and what, in which, which ways we can represent our data so that we achieve those outcomes. So here's uh, um, just a view of, of what the, not what a teacher would actually see, but, <laughs> so we never actually show this to an instructor, but uh, it's the ways in which we are capturing data that then the AI can process and merge and, and re-represent for a teacher in ways that they can actually manage to, to reflect and, and process it in order to improve their practice. And then I think we just have one other here. Um, uh, on uh, social programmable robots, uh, which is a new project that we've just started in which um, uh, students aren't just programming robots uh, and therefore controlling them in order to learn concepts of programming and concepts of robotics, but where the robot itself actually becomes a part of the team, where the robot has agency, can speak back uh, to the participants, and to can not only make them feel more comfortable in this situation, but also challenge them in new ways um, while being supportive in that environment for, for um, in particular for girls and members of underrepresented groups who may not feel that comfort with robotics that allows them to fully engage in these experiences. So just two examples of projects that we're working on where um, with tons and tons of collaborators where, uh, where these sorts of advanced technologies are actually uh, an intrinsic value into the system. Um, and Derek, I think you said you were good, so we'll, we'll change over to Tom. So I, um, I, in, the, in the spirit of fusion, um, one of the projects I also wanted to mention um, which is kind of drawing on this idea of advancing technology and what do we actually do with advanced technologies to address human needs and human challenges. Um, actually, just this past weekend, we uh, hosted uh, myself along with uh, Heather Kelly of the Entertainment Technology Center and Teresa Devine at uh, Arizona State University held a game jam slash hackathon to really get at this idea of what um, an inclusive experience is like for someone using a wheelchair as well as people who may not use wheelchairs to create really fun and entertaining um, experiences overall for um, kind of broader society to really kind of counter this idea that technology, especially in accessibility, should be designed for people with disabilities, really drawing on like co-design 
to emphasize design with um, with uh, all of the groups involved. And so we had people uh, building, we had brought in four teams and had them build low, both high and low tech um, experiences around just having fun with each other, um, which could have used any number of things. We had a team that created a new inclusive laser tag game, which is maybe not the highest tech thing, but um, they created a game, changed the rules a little bit to make it more fun for everyone, including um, a service dog who could participate in the game as well. Um, who's amazing. Oak is the best. I'll introduce you all to Oak. Um, but also it's kind of more higher tech things. So being able to track motion and represent uh, someone's experience through just throughout their day, um, throughout their daily commute um, as brush strokes on a painting. So being able to actually incorporate those things in life for enjoyment purposes. Uh, in addition to that, another project that uh, I've been working on with collaborators here, I was on this idea of social media access, which I think a lot of us can think of as kind of a high tech, advancing tech issue. And we're applying a lot of um, machine learning and AI techniques to really address this issue. Uh, what you may not be aware of, you may be aware of, uh, social media, I think we can all agree that it's filled with a lot of visual content, imagery, and, visu and uh, videos. Um, but if you actually take a really closer look, a deep dive, what you'll find is that less than 0.1% of that visual content, especially on Twitter, actually has uh, additional descriptions for people who may not be able to see that content. So as uh, computer scientists, we're really excited about the idea of having visual descriptions of images for both search um, and other algorithmic um, operations. But for people just experiencing the web, um, experiencing this content, this may not be uh, immediately accessible. Um, so there are ways that we can automatically add alternative text and descriptions to these images. Um, but what it, really turned, what it really boils down to is that this is a fundamentally human challenge of how do you get people to engage with their own content and create these experiences for people that they may not be thinking about. And so this is uh, kind of one thrust of this work is uh, present providing methods for generating these, these descriptions as well as how do we motivate people. And one of the most, I think, currently one of the things that we're getting a lot of traction on is making memes accessible, which is something you might not think about. But how do you represent humor in a visual format? In, uh, how do you translate humor in a visual format into a non-visual uh, language? Um, so I'm a big fan of technology. Actually, on the homepage of our website, we literally said we engineer from nano to macro, we turn fiction into reality. So, so because I really believe, I believed and I believe, um, uh, the emerging technology, especially the, the emerging technology that are a little bit outside of our students' comfortable zone, meaning more integration of you know chemistry, biology, and physics and uh, material sciences are really giving us new power, uh, the power to design, to empower. Um, so 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 then, on the other hand, I think you almost out of a, a party conversation. Me and Amy uh, had, and she said, you know, I'm I traveled in Africa again trying to develop a fundamental curriculum. I think for elementary school or even, yeah. So she said, you know, no technology and we don't even have a curriculum. So I'm like, I kind of, I kind of think that's true. It's hard for me to imagine my self healing materials that's made of single wall carbon nanotube that's eight times more expensive like, than diamond enter those places and make real impact. Um, that I guess that actually inspired us to think about or bring up this topic to to our audiences. Uh, what's what's more important? Maybe it's um, a harmonious effort. We, it's more about s swimming between different uh, different perspectives and think about what makes sense for different contexts and project per project. They could be different as well. Um, so this I brought this example. So. A morphing matter lab also works on food. These are morphing food. So at the top left corner of each image um, is the flat pasta. So when we produce them, they were flat. And then when you cook them in water, uh, after it boils for a couple of minutes, it started to self-assemble into a 3D shape. So you can create variety of different self-folding pastas in this way. Um, and uh, so by making pasta flat, you can uh, you can save almost 60% of the packaging space averagely. Um, and uh, it started as a high-tech project, indeed, when I was still a PhD student uh, two years ago at the MIT Media Lab. And we, uh, yeah, we did uh, all these um, 
synthetic, uh, uh, synthetically derived biomaterial, bilayer, you know, gelatin, methylcellulose, and we 3D print very complicated patterns. We're doing numeric simulations to understand how the swelling rate will be different when we fold them up. Um, and we made this very fictional video and told the world that uh, shape changing pasta were coming. Um, and everybody believed so, and Target and the Barilla came to us, and they told told us nobody eat gelatin. Even you depicted the beautiful vision of a self shape changing pasta. But we love the fact that uh, um, you guys are talking about saving packaging space because Italians are crazy about 3D pasta, 3D shaped pasta, and it make a lot of sense when you uh, don't want to pack your pasta. Uh, when you don't want to pack air in 3D shaped pasta, and also it'll um, it, it'll also bring the real time experiences for this for for the cooking and eating. Um, so, but uh, they also hated our 3D printing process. They were like, "There's no way you can integrate 3D printing to such a cheap commodity product." Um, and that's what we did after we um, uh, brought more talents uh, around CMU. This is the newest outcome. It's pretty much integrated into the current pasta manufacturing process. We're using pure semolina flour, indeed, grown <laughs> in Italy all the way shipped to Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, there were no 3D printers anymore. It was dough kneading and sheeting. And then you were just uh, literally have one additional uh, grooving process. And the, the local Italian pasta manufacturer really liked this concept. So it taught me a lesson, taught me a lesson that it is not true because you are in a high tech university, you, you think you can do whatever with the newest technology, you will just do that. I think depends on the goal, right? And for this one, we wanted, we wanted the world to experience it. So then we tried very hard to make it low tech. So think about this kind of fun. Curiosity driven, technical driven research versus do you want to think about the user um, and uh, what makes sense? <laughs> So um, thank you all. I think we're going to transition into kind of the Q&A. And I think I'll, I'll kick it off a little bit with thinking about something that Lenning just brought up um, uh, just now around, and which was kind of figured into each of the presentations. So thinking about the kind of contextual importance of each project and, and kind of making decisions about how to move forward when presented with the kind of pushback, in the case of Lenning, from target um, and things like this and kind of cultural understandings of what might actually work. Um, and in that case, industrial understandings of what might work. So I wonder if you could each uh, talk for a moment about how you kind of manage, maybe through a particular project, um, the kind of cultural um, implications of, of each of your work. Um, so I think for me, one of the really salient things comes from my work working in um, spinal cord injury clinics. So thinking about how we can make more expressive interfaces for people who are using wheelchairs. And the kind of testing ground for developing this was actually going into uh, the International Center for Spinal Cord Injury, uh, working with patients there and talking to them about technology challenges that they faced. Um, and basically proposing, uh, part of the study actually was to propose um, different interaction techniques. So I'll I essentially did a literature search and found kind of the most cited new out there technologies. And I pulled up maybe three or four projects from CMU um, and presented um, these ideas. So this uh, on-world projection, uh, skin-based uh, interfaces, acoustic design um, interaction techniques. And I proposed this, put this up on a projector screen and had everybody talk about it and say, okay, what kinds of things would you want to make? What kinds of things would you want to be able to do with this? And the immediate pushback was, well, first of all, I don't want a projector strapped to my face. Um, if I use the projector out in the world, um, then everyone can see my text messages. How, how, how well tested is this uh, system? So even for things like private gesture-based interactions, um, the patients especially, patients and the wheelchair users who joined the study were very hesitant to this idea of just doing anything new in that space. And it wasn't until we actually worked with the clinicians and the clinicians brought these ideas to the patients that anyone was really accepting of it. So it took you know, a, a few days for us to actually get anything going to get any of the creative uh, elements of this kind of out. And the whole purpose was to develop these futuristic 
and kind of out there interfaces, like what is this ideal future that we're heading towards? Um, because of the first three days, we kept coming back to, well, I just want another button. I have, I have one button, now I want two. And so by the end of it, we're talking, you know, really these natural interfaces like I proposed before, but it really was this um, discrepancy where you have to understand the systems that are in place to get the technology kind of into this field, into the space where people are going to both trust and um, kind of, I guess, uh, be accepting of that solution. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a little different tangent on this, which is thinking about um, uh, stakeholder desires uh, and how they can sometimes be at, in conflict with what the research might suggest as an appropriate solution to the challenge you're currently working on. So um, uh, we certainly have cases, actually, unlike your um, case where Berla came and said, no, got to keep it cheap, got to keep it um, you know, accessible, uh, where governments have come to us and said, what we want in, in education is technology. <laughs> and it doesn't matter sort of what it does or... <laughs> Or, or what the, the cost is in the end, but our, our students need to be engaged with technology, and that's part of our long-term plan, um, without having really a deep understanding of what that type of solution might take in order to be successful in the schools at the lower level where the teachers are having to engage with it, where the students are having to engage with it, and what that sort of uh, effort would take. Well, on the other hand, um, here at Carnegie Mellon, we've been working with instructors with these high-tech systems. The, the instructors, you know, want feedback. They want to improve their teaching, but they're incredibly nervous about having somebody videotape them while they're, they're teaching um, for a variety of reasons. So, um, so on the other hand, in a, in a high-resource place, the, maybe the most high-resource you could imagine, we're... You know, we're here at an elite university where the um, instructors are all experts and, and they're all super interested in advanced technologies and, and they're afraid of, of the cameras. And so balance, even though they know there's very little other way for them to get the sort of feedback that we're able to present when we introduce such a system. So balancing the, the stakeholder fears, um, actually the, the government fear about technology and education is again about being left behind. So you know we're we're the the only ones out there who are not going to have laptops in the classroom, and and our students need to be part of the future too. So balancing the fears and the aspirations uh, of the stakeholders, in addition to uh, the potential value and outcomes that the technology could produce is something that we're really concerned about and, and working with on a case-by-case -case basis, as Lenning said. So um, one of the balances, I think, is you know, going into a context and understanding what help people need. Right? Um, it's a really valuable approach in HCI design research is to just try to directly help people um, with what they need. Um, and I think that being able to balance that with the development and cultivation of a, a, a shared vision for the future um, is a nice way of uh, uh, finding that balance because we don't want to just find out what uh, Barilla thinks is the next incremental step. Um, it just isn't that interesting. Uh, and being able to have our own sort of visions of the future that we can drive forward while also um, uh, trying to just be helpful. Uh, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate about HCI as a field is that it lets us look at social issues and, and really try to make impact in the world while doing cool stuff. So I think um, I just want to recap for a second and then we'll open it up for questions. But one thing I wanted to do to kind of celebrate across all of your work is to kind of lift up the notion that all of this is happening integrated, this integrated practice where it melds together interests of advancing technologies, but not without and not um, kind of uh, putting aside this notion of addressing human needs. All of this is happening um, in, within one institute, uh, which is 
from my experience, quite rare. Um, so you might see uh, kind of uh, people within uh, kind of interested in HDI across campus, and you have to traverse that, which can be sometimes very hard. Uh, but here, it's happening all in one place, and there's a kind of deep respect, a respect and appreciation for these different kinds of knowledges um, and ways of doing this work um, that I see across all of this work and across um, HDII in general. So that was just a kind of a moment to um, celebrate the 25th and where we are now. But I also want to open up um, uh, and have plenty of time for questions. So uh, feel free. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree that, you know, getting some feedback from the stakeholders help. But for some of these problems that, you know, all of you are working on, there are like so many potential stakeholders, right? And as you were saying that the government will have a completely different perspective than what an instructor might have. But at the same time, different instructors within the same organization might have different uh, uh, feedback. Of course, like, you know, if you get it from enough people, you can find the patterns there. But still, like, there could be, uh, like, large variability there. And then if you talk to the students, then that might be completely different. Talking to the alumni might be even different because they might not like the pressure that they feel on daily basis, but three years down the line, maybe they start finding the benefits or like, you know, start appreciating that. So how do you find like across different problems, like who's the right uh, stakeholder? That is an excellent question. Um, so we have certainly had circumstances in our work where um, uh, we initiate a technology-based education program, uh, and mysteriously, two of the teachers are absent every day <laughs> that the uh, technology is present in the classroom. Um, so, right, so demonstrating the variability that, that one might see in adopting something, even, even within a single school. Um, but on the other hand, what we also see happen is, uh, you know, we, we select, maybe select some teachers to start working with, um, and over the course of a, a month, other teachers pop their head in and say, hey, are, are, is this available for anyone else to use? Um, so uh, while you have some who might absent themselves, uh, others who uh, may not originally have been part of the deployment or solution who got incredibly invested. And I think this um, uh, leads us to a, a solution where um, what one approach that I have learned through being in the HCI and, and through conversations with the rest of the fa faculty here is to have ambassadors for your solution. It's never going to work for everybody, and it's never going to get everyone on board uh, on day one. But the more, in my particular case, teachers that advocate for this to other teachers, the more parents that love it and then are willing to go out and talk to other parents about how to get involved, um, the more kids that get excited about it can talk to the rest. and, and um, so uh, there has to be some tipping point where there's enough people that feel like this is a, a helpful solution that you actually want to, to start developing it in the first place. But um, beyond that, getting stakeholder ambassadors sort of at every level is, is the approach that we've taken. I think that um, in seeing the sort of broader system, there'll be different layers of hierarchy um, and understanding uh, who pulls what lever uh, can be really helpful. Um, in, in our case, uh, uh, you know, the companies that distribute the textbooks are a particularly powerful place for introducing changes. And so if you start with the kind of impact that you're trying to create and then see where in the system there's opportunities to intervene, sometimes it's in... I, so this is mostly me projecting my own fears onto the panel, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> I, I feel like all of the panel participants here are also very thoughtful uh, and very careful with how you develop either technology or media. 
the needs of people. And, you know, there's lots of people who aren't and they can put stuff out there faster. <laughs> uh, and I really worry that sometimes, you know, this careful, nice, uh, methodical way of going about things is great, but we're too slow. <laughs> uh, and so that's my fear. If you guys have any comforting words, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know how comforting it is, but, um, so one of the things, and maybe it's also from my, maybe I'm biased by my sheltered environment. Um, one of the things that I, I like to think about is that when you put technology out there, especially when it's an actual solution, the users will sort it out. Um, so when we're introducing some technology that doesn't quite, isn't as thoughtful, not as thoughtful of a solution, it tends to miss some major things. And this is especially important for accessibility work. Uh, you put this solution out there, it's the new revolutionary thing that's gonna help you do X task. But it turns out that helping you do X task means that you can no longer do Z, A, B, and D that you could do before. Um, which means that that solution then gets kind of thrown to the wind, even though it was the most innovative thing um, at the time. And so it's not until someone comes around and says, okay, but these are the 10 things you wanna do with this device that it actually gets adopted and then held onto. And then you can develop further on top of this, uh, this base that you get. And uh, um, I, I also think this is a little controversial um, personal opinion, not <laughs> so, so So I think, Different research, different project has different goals. For example, like the PASA thing, I just believed I wanted to de democratize it and find the collaborator who loved to do so. I do think that PASA has the potential to, to create a real benefit. That is the value of that research. But there are also the fact that we are in, you know, a university, we are protected in a greenhouse is to actually to also is to make me felt we can do something that is not purely for execution or making sure we are, you know, juggling between stakeholders and make sure this thing can be deployed and can make impact in real life. It could be just to, to inspire and to envision. And it could be just for seeking a curiosity driven knowledge uh, or question. So, so. There are a lot of, for example, the self-healing <laughs> material that's eight times more expensive than diamond. I, I really don't think we are working on it because we believe this will be deployed as a game controller supported by Microsoft next year or in the next five years. It's more about, hey, think about it. You know, where, where the, the, the material driven computation will go. And if we believe this is part of the future, um, can we start to tell the story and invite everyone to imagine the possibility? So, so I think that is actually the charm of being a institutional researcher. <laughs> Maybe one quick word of comfort. Uh, in a presentation I was giving to some ministers of education a year ago, uh, at the end of it, they all started laughing, and for uh, I wasn't sure why, <laughs> and they said. Thank you for talking to us about something that doesn't work. We never hear about things that don't work. We only hear about people promoting their products. And they were really hungry for this. They wanted to know what, you know, what solutions are not the right solutions for, for our uh, constituents as well. So that gave me some hope that, similar to what Patrick said, that sort of the, you know, there's room for this, for finding things that, that aren't successful and and for finding ways to replace them. Yeah. Yeah, one thought, just to kind of echo both of the points you've already heard. Um, it becomes this really important thing. So like putting that vision out there is the first step in getting people to even kind of explore that problem space. And so it has to get out there. Otherwise, it can't fail. You know, fail fast and fail often. That's how you learn. So if you're going to do it, you should put it out there and be, own, be open and honest about the successes that it has. So I really like the discussions on um, education and what it can do for people who are in deep poverty and what it can be for an escape from that. Uh, one of the things is, you know, 
being the technologist that I am, one of the things that's concerned me as I've looked at those is if I reach all the way to the bottom of poverty, they can't afford my technology. They can't even afford, you know, a $150 Chromebook. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot of work on sort of not the third world, but the 2.5 world where that $150 Chromebook is economically viable. And then what can we, and so I'm, I, I wonder if you have any insight on, you know, it's, can we lift a little bit above the deepest poverty to a place where our technology actually can reach and what, what success or failure have we had there? I'm sure Derek has some thoughts on this too. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is one of the reasons that I like engaging with these textbook companies because the opportunity to, um, in the States, high poverty schools uh, receive special funding for technology. And uh, the distribution of that technology is difficult, but that's what some of these companies do. And they're not tech companies, I mean, most of them. Um, and the opportunity to build in, I think, requires a sensitivity to uh, the challenges that teachers face in managing a classroom. Um, smart classrooms typically means We've got a bunch of computers in them, and there's a bunch of tech. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make a classroom sort of smart or effective. I like this Forrest Gump view of AI, like the stupid is the stupid does. Like, if it's working, that's smart. Um, and it doesn't need computers necessarily. But there is a, a big role for technology. Um, one of those is looking at a sort of systems level, so not just in the classroom, but how to help these companies and organizations use data about the trouble spots in their products so that they can make impact for thousands of kids. So you're working at a sort of different layer. Within the classroom, we've been looking a lot at, um, at paper because uh, I think we all thought that, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, paper was just doomed. And once we had enough tech, I mean, why use paper anymore? But seeing, seeing how easy it is for teachers to hand out sheets of paper versus hand out tablets, laptops, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's, a, it's a real lift. And trying to make these sort of systems smarter by letting the data that is collected on that paper go into systems that can support improvement, um, there's lots of neat tech for being able to uh, capture it you know, with a phone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so being able to have sort of uh, a variety of different ways that people can apply things differently. Because one thing is that no one ever does what exactly they're supposed to do. And uh, these classroom teachers, I mean, they've, they've got a lot of autonomy and they, they should have a lot of autonomy, um, but it means that it's going to have a, a lot of variation. Um, I'll share just one more thing because it's, it's uh, uh, pertinent working with, uh, with Carnegie Learning to create an A-B testing platform within their educational software. So the, the opportunity to embed scientific experimentation for the optimization of student outcomes, this is one of those places where it, you're not, not necessarily making cooler tech in the classroom for the student, et cetera, et cetera, but allowing the overall system to know what's working and to respond in a, a faster feedback cycle. Thank you. 
enough. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Hopefully this one's working. Enough um, uh, um, uh, mentoring from inspectors who are coming out to the schools on a regular basis. Uh, but it needed all of the rest of the infrastructure around it, and it also needed that support from the government uh, at a, a systemic level in order to be able to, to make that low level in the classroom, the, the technology work. So I, th I think there, there are a lot of places in the world that are at a level where an introduction of technology is the right thing to do, but they, they need that systemic level of support and, and they need the income level to be able to, to do that as a, as a country. <laughs> well, so for instance, um, we're working right now with the MasterCard Foundation and Carnegie Mellon in particular is starting a, a collaboration with them in Africa, um, working with, uh, uh, to improve education across the continent. But the way they're doing this is to go about identifying anchor countries where they will begin and there had to be several factors for someone to be considered an anchor country, which is deep and sustained interest on the part of the Ministry of Education. So they're showing up to meetings, uh, they're calling in, they're, they're engaging, they're talking about the problems that they're having in their country, and then a, a level of financial um, uh, support that it's not all coming from external sources. So, um, so it... That's a, a, an approach that takes time. You have to identify, you know, which, uh, which countries or which um, stakeholders are, are coming and showing up and putting in the work themselves. And also take some money. It certainly took the external money coming in, but, but then, uh, you know, a demonstration of financial commitment on the part of the, the stakeholders as well. So it takes time and money, but, but, it doesn't <laughs> but it doesn't have to be complete happenstance. I think you can put out you know, a call into the world for partners like that and make that happen. I guess one kind of boring response to this debate is, you know, do both, right? And and in some level, uh, <laughs> as HCI has emerged, uh, almost as a discipline with some risks that Dan was telling us about last time, <laughs> yesterday, right? Um, you know, all of you, it's it's clear. Think about advancing technology and, and think about, you know, whether it's going to make a difference for, for people. So I'm wondering, like, how do we, where do we go from there? Like, is, is, is HCI a discipline in part because we all do all of these things? Uh, and do we need to, like, can, can we revisit the three-legged stool that we started with, which were the disciplines, the, uh, um, the, the plates uh, that, that we're rubbing together before? Now that they're not rubbing together anymore, <laughs> what are the new plates that, uh, that, that, that we should be thinking of? You know, like, like, I don't know, instead of technology, maybe un unconstrained innovation, uh, Right? Maybe it's not just about the technology, it's about it thinking in an unconstrained way, which gets a little bit away from human needs and human wants, but sometimes it's really productive because it's unconstrained. And you know, Maybe there's something like understanding and designing for what people need, understanding and designing for what people want. Are, are those, maybe those are new three legs and, and then the disciplines. Something we need to sort of learn how to measure, um, bake into the uh, the work. Where, you know, have a have a measure of it. Learn how to measure it, teach it, and then use it to avoid doing something like building technology for technology's sake, right? And I think one of the things we're talking about here is having a breadth of things that maybe have different ROT or different potential ROT. But the the playfulness, I think, that's so beautiful in the approaches that you show. It, I, I think show why we want to 
do things without necessarily the return on uh, investment because it's either beautiful or through the play we discover things that are fundamental that we can apply in other places. But, but could the return be delight? Ooh, I like that. <laughs> there you go. Um, also, just to address Ken's question, it's it's very interesting. I felt um, you you asked there where it used to be three legs. I am still learning our, our history is through this, but you mean uh, psychology, behavior, learning, technology. Uh, technology. Yeah, yeah. It does reminds me. This is not me invented term, but there is a we we talk a lot of this idea not transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary, we are anti-disciplinary. So I think um, students come in with their own background and then they get intimidated. You're, oh, you're a material science lab, I'm a computer scientist. I don't even know how, uh, you are cool, but I don't want to join you because I don't know how to work with materials and make my hand dirty. So I think it's almost a mindset um, that, uh, that uh, the, maybe we should uh, let our students know uh, they need the intelligence, the passion, and of course, they have to take courses to get into everything, but the inherent magic, uh, magic part of our department is that we are, we, we are, we have the gut to think um, out of our comfortable zone. I think rather than thinking of three legs, maybe there's, there's just one leg, but one leg that is really unique to the department. I think that's the magic of HCII. Um, so yeah, I, so I think the true, how to say this, the true integration of the department to me, maybe it is one person who can talk about from a psychological uh, user experience perspective, but also technical perspective and even technical uh, across different different fields kind of perspective. Doesn't, yeah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I would just add to your metaphor specifically, especially with the one-legged stool. Um, it really is a balancing act of doing all of these different things well. Um, so you can think of it as kind of this perfect balance. Like when you have really good HCI work, I think one of the things that as a discipline that um, we kind of push forward is that we're not just kind of muddling through all three or all five of these things. We have approaches that you can apply in different uh, areas. So it's not quite, also not quite unconstrained, but it's thoughtfully constrained so that you actually do um, develop a well-designed, well-developed, solution that does meet human needs. Hi. Um, you're a panel of HCI today, and we have founders, we have practitioners and educators and students in the audience. Uh, and we have a panel on the future coming up. And I think all of that's really exciting. Um, I guess I was wondering something that you think we as all those different roles can be doing better. You know, where are we today? And what should we be keeping in mind today as areas that we collectively can improve? Nothing, actually. It's <laughs> easy, but it's pretty awesome. Like... <laughs> if, I, if I had anything to add to that, it would really just be... <laughs> if there's something. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit more than nothing. Um, but it, it would just be the continuing to have conversations that involve past, present, and future um, in order to keep doing nothing, essentially. <laughs> okay, let's thank the panel. <laughs>